So in this final section of the Lecture 5 series, we're going to ask what would happen if you wanted to compare means between more than two independent populations. Suppose you're interested in the relationship between smoking and mid-expiratory flow, a measure of pulmonary health. Suppose you recruit study subjects and classify them into one of six smoking categories, non-smokers, passive smokers, or secondhand smokers, if you will, non-inhaling smokers, light smokers, moderate smokers, and heavy smokers. And you're interested in whether differences exist in mean FEF, forced expiratory flow, amongst the six groups. The main outcome here is the mid-expiratory flow in liters per second. You've got six groups that you want to compare means between. One strategy would be to perform a lot of two-sample t-tests for each possible two-group combination. In this example, there's six groups. Believe it or not, there would be 15 comparisons that you would need to do. Non-smokers to passive smokers, non-smokers to non-inhaling smokers, and so on. It would be nice, at least from a hypothesis testing perspective, to have one catch-all test something which would tell you whether there were any differences, statistically speaking, between the means of the six groups. If the answer was no, you'd be done, at least from a hypothesis standpoint. But if there were differences between some of the six groups, then you could do a group-to-group -group comparisons to look for specific group differences. Well, there actually is a catch-all test, something called analysis of variance, or one-way ANOVA, ANOVA is just the acronym for analysis of variance. ANOVA is just an extension of the two-sample t-test. The two-sample t-test compares the means in two populations through two samples from those populations. ANOVA compares means among more than two populations with one test. All we can get from ANOVA is a p-value, and the p-value from ANOVA helps answer the question, are there any differences in the means between the populations we're comparing. The general idea behind ANOVA when we're comparing the means for K groups, K is just a number greater than two. In our example with smoking and respiratory health, there were six groups, so K would be six. And the null in ANOVA is that all of the group means are equal mu1, equals mu2, equals mu3, equals equals mu k. And the alternative is that at least one mean is different. So let's go back to the smoking example. And I postulated that as if you were going to do the study, but actually this study has been done. It was actually done in 1980, or reported in 1980 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And a sample of over 3,000 persons was classified into one of six smoking categorizations based on responses to smoking-related questions. And it's the six classifications we enumerated before. For each smoking group, a random sample of 200 men was drawn, except for the non-inhalers, as there were only 50 non-inhalers in the entire sample. And then they took the forced mid-expiratory flow measurements, the FE measurements, were taken on each of these subjects. And here's the summary data. And I'll just cut to the punchline here, and then I'll tell you how to interpret it. Based on a one-way analysis of variance, there are statistically significant differences in forced mid-expiratory flow levels, FEF levels, between the six smoking groups. The P was less than 0.01. So now what we need to do is now all we know with that p-value is that at least one mean is different than the others. And now we would actually need to go for combinations of groups to find out where the differences are and to quantify them with confidence intervals using t-test-like approach. But before we get into that, let's just talk about why, if we're dealing with means, comparing means, why is it called analysis of variance? Remember, variance is a synonym for standard deviation or variability. Variance is standard deviation squared. Well, the variability or variation in sample means between the groups is compared to the variation within each of the groups. In other words, the variability between the sample means how much noise there is from sample mean to sample mean is compared to the average variability of individual observations around their respective sample means. If the between-group variation is a lot bigger than the within-group variation, that suggests that there are some differences among the populations. So here's a schematic trying to illustrate that here I plotted the sample mean FEF levels for each of the smoking groups, 
and then put a dotted line around the sample mean to imply variability of individual values. It's not a true representation, but just to give you the idea. It's not the true standard deviation or the sample standard, just to give a visual. And then on the right-hand side, I actually traced those sample means over and looked at how much they vary around that red line, which is the overall mean of all observations, and the, correspondingly the mean of those six sample means. And the idea is if the variation of the individual sample means around the overall mean is greater than the average variability of individual values around their sample means, then it suggests that the means in the groups are different. That's the idea. So again, we did this for the smoking and FEF example and found a statistically significant result, indicating that at least one mean was different than the others. So if we were to write this up, we might say 200 men were randomly selected from each of five smoking classification groups, as well as 50 men classified as non-inhaling smokers for a study designed to analyze the relationship between smoking and respiratory function. Analysis of variance was used to test for any differences in mean FEF levels among the six groups of men. Individual group comparisons were performed with a series of two sample t-tests, and 95% confidence intervals were constructed for the mean difference in FEF between each combination of groups. I didn't actually show that, and I won't, but we could have done that, and that would have been appropriate. Analysis of variance showed statistically significant differences in FEF between the six groups of smokers. That sentence alone is not a lot of information. It just shows that we can rule out random sampling error as the reason that we saw differences in sample means. So here's where we get into the real information component. Non-smokers had the highest mean FEF value, 3.78 liters per second, and this was statistically significantly larger than the five other smoking classification groups. So here, I report the results of five t-tests all at once by saying that this mean alone was different than the other five groups. And you can verify that on your own if you want, because I gave you the individual group summary data to do the t-tests. The mean FEF value for non-smokers was 1.19 liters per second higher than the mean FEF for heavy smokers. Here's a 95% confidence interval. And this was the largest mean difference between any two smoking groups. So another piece of information amongst the six groups, where was the largest discrepancy in combinations of groups? Then I say confidence intervals for all smoking group FEF comparisons are in Table 1. And that's not true. There's no Table 1 to show you. But if you were interested, you have all the data to create one. Truthfully, you probably wouldn't show 15 different confidence intervals for each combination of two groups for comparison. But you would give the highlights like I have in this previous slides. Here's another example of analysis of variance also dealing with respiratory health, although you can use this method for things other than respiratory outcomes, FYI. So here's FEV1, another measure of pulmonary health, and three medical centers. And this was a study designed to look at patients with coronary artery disease, and data was collected on them from three medical centers, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, Rancho Los Amigos, and the St. Louis University School of Medicine. And before the researchers got going and collected data on exposures to carbon monoxide and the change in pulmonary measures, they wanted to see if whether the groups were comparable in terms of their baseline pulmonary health. So what they wanted to do was actually compare the FEV1 measures on average between the three samples from the three patient center populations. And here's a snippet of the data and status. And here I'm going to show you to actually how to do this in Stata and get a p-value. So here's a listing of observations 20 through 30, and it just gives the center. So the first two observations are from Johns Hopkins, the JH, the subsequent eight are from Rancho Los Amigos, RLA. The center is actually a numerical variable that's been labeled with those initials for different values. And then we have the FEV1 measure of each subject. Since we have the luxury of individual level data, we can actually look at the box plots of the distribution of FEV1 values by center. And you can see that those at Larancho Los Amigos have the highest values, followed by those at St. Louis University, followed by those at Johns Hopkins when you compare the medians, but there's a lot of crossover in the distributions between the three groups. So it's hard to tell whether this is overwhelming evidence of similarity or differences.
we actually wanted to then take into account sampling variation when comparing the three groups. We could do analysis of variance. And here's the ANOVA in state of the syntax is the word one way for one way ANOVA. Then you put your outcome variable, in our case that's FEV1. Then you put your grouping variable, in our case that's what I call center. So here typing one way FEV1 center, you get the following table here. There's a lot of information here, but the thing to focus on, since we're really only getting a p-value here, is that value in the upper right-hand corner in the last column of 0.0520. You see right next to it, there's a column labeled F and that number 3.12. Well, that's the discrepancy measure between what we observed and what we would have expected under the null, and that's actually a comparison of the between group variability to the within and we compare that number to the proper distribution to get that p-value of 0.05. So here we have an interesting result. What do you do with a p-value that's 0.052? Wow. If our rejection level is 0.05, we might be bummed. We almost made it, but we didn't quite. Technically speaking, this is not less than 0.05. It's not significant. Well, in this situation here, the researchers are hoping that the folks in the study are comparable in terms of the baseline FEV. So technically speaking here, we have a non-statistically significant difference, and they'd probably claim that and say they're statistically equivalent. However, if I were doing the research myself, even though we couldn't technically reject the null of no difference in the FEV1 means, I paid particular attention to the possibility of differences, and in my subsequent analyses on the respiratory outcomes after exposure to carbon dioxide, I may do that comparison with and without taking into account possible baseline differences. Something we'll see how to do in stat reasoning, too, how to account for potential differences in baseline measures. I'd compare those results to see how sensitive they were to accounting for that versus not. Because even though this difference is not technically statistically significant, we have relatively small samples here. The box plot showed some potential evidence of differences, and of course we could then look at the means and confidence intervals for them as well within each of the groups. So in any case, this shows you how to operationalize analysis of variance in Stata. But remember, if you have the data in Stata and you can do analysis of variance, you can do all the other summary measures equally as easily. So there's no reason you should just hang on to the p-value as the only piece of information. This concludes our whole series of lecture on two and more group comparisons of means. When we go into lecture six, we'll be doing these same exact things, but with binary outcomes.